This is Bewilderbeasts, an infotainment show dedicated to inspiring curiosity for all ages by investigating the ways animals intersect at humanity. I am not a historian, an ethologist, a researcher, a scientist, a zoologist, a trained audio engineer, or an expert in, well, anything. Y'all, I'm lucky if I can remember to put my clean laundry in the dryer before it gets funky. And while I make every effort to present things as accurately as I can with a fun flair, I'm going to mess up. And that's okay. I hope I've given you a nice place to jump off from on your own adventures into curiosity. Or at the very least, I've given you the key to win your next round of trivia. Oh, and welcome to Bewilder Beasts, recording in a room I overperfumed. I'm your host, Melissa McKee McGrath, and today is the 50th episode of what I thought would be like maybe six tops. So, in the spirit of Mythbusters and the Muppets, we're going to celebrate by blowing stuff up. All right, let's go. I wanted to start this episode off today by recommending a podcast that I'm totally digging called Your Brain on Facts by Moxie Labouche. She generally takes a subject and does some fun little deep dives on it, including an episode on Acoustic Kitty, a story that we covered here on episode 25. She's covered tattoos and typos that led to lawsuits. That's an amazing episode. So if you get a chance, go take a listen. And if there's a show that you think that I would like, please let me know. I love hearing about new things, and since I walk several miles a day now to get to a bus stop, I could use some more info in my ear holes. Okay, so on today's episode, this is one that I've been thinking about for a really long time, and I'm so excited to finally tell this story. It is a family-friendly show, but keep in mind one person in the story, the main character of most of what I'm going to talk about today, absolutely inspired much of the character of Cersei from A Song of Ice and Fire, the books that became the Game of Thrones phenomenon from a few years back. Not the sibling uh, affection or the extramarital affection, but basically everything else. This gets so good. And we have my favorite characters coming back. Did someone say pigeons? And, and wacky military shenanigans. Guys, this story has it all. Let's go. And when I say patron saint, I want to paint a picture. Most people assume gives to the poor, is kind, ends up on a candle or a statue where people come and pray for guidance. While I tell you this story and how it relates to the military shenanigans of World War II, just remember two words. Patron saint. Olga of Kiev was a princess who became the first recorded female ruler of Kiev. She's also the first ruler of Kiev to adopt Christianity. She was canonized as the first Russian saint of the Orthodox Church, and she's the patron saint of widows and converts. Both of these we will discuss in great detail. Because when you think patron saint, you might think women are delicate flowers, and Olga would like to disavow you of that notion immediately. She would, if they had a lawnmower back then, mow over all those flowers. So Olga married this guy prince or king, the details are fuzzy, Igor. That's the name you need to know, Igor. There are two versions of how things ended for poor Igor. The first is that Igor would do what he was expected, go from tribe to tribe, city to city, neighborhood to, you know, neighborhoods of a sort within his kingdom to collect taxes. He happened upon one such tribe, the Drevelians. He got paid, and as he was walking away, he mentioned to his squad, hey, they seem like they're doing just fine. Let's go get second taxes from these guys. They can afford it. If this is how the story starts, this is probably where they should have left things. The second version, the Drevelians hated the idea of paying taxes and just didn't. They didn't agree with paying taxes after their ruler Oleg died. His successor, Igor, we've already met him, went in to say, Hey guys, I noticed you haven't played your taxes in a while. Can we just get off on the right foot? And if this is how the story starts, this was all in the Drevelians and their first mistake. Either way, it's at this point Eager got some pushback from the Drevelians in a form of a little light assassination. 
the Dravalians revolted and proceeded to kill him with a tree. Well, technically two trees. He was, according to some, captured by the Dravalians, tied to tree trunks, and torn in two. Something about how they bend, and when they release, they bend back, and if they're gonna go in opposite directions... Yeesh. I didn't know tree murder was a thing, but apparently it was. The Drevlians decided to use this momentum to take Igor's lady and land. This was their first or second mistake, depending on which story to believe. It's at this point the Drevlians got a bit overconfident and things started to go terribly wrong for the Drevlians. They assumed, incorrectly, that Olga, the delicate flower she was, at home running a kingdom, now a widow, she must be mourning so hard and raising a young son all on her own. Well, she would just need a big, tough man to come in and help her with all this Kiev land, right? So she'll just have to roll right over because ladies don't talk back to men, right? Especially if your leader is, and I'm not making this up, named Maul. Yep, the Drevlian leader who assassinated Olga's husband was named Maul, as in Darth Maul. Anyway, sounds pretty ominous. The Drevlians walked up uninvited to Olga's palace, said, Hey, our leader doesn't really have online dating yet, but he's really interested in you. He killed your husband. He's a catch. And Olga said, look, I have to talk with my people. How about this? Y'all load up your boat with gold and silk and riches, whatever you have. Come back tomorrow and my men will be there. They will respect you, but only if you say, carry us to your princess and we will remain in the boat. The Drevlians thought, weird lady, but sure, this seems a little too easy. The second they left, Olga leans over to her people and says, Hey guys, start digging. You have 24 hours. The next day, the boat rolled up. Olga's servants were there waiting. The Drevlians used the secret code word, Carry us to your princess in our boat filled with riches. And they were carried all right. Apparently, carry me to the castle was code for tip the boat upside down and bury them alive, which is what they did in Olga's courtyard. Patron saint. Because Twitter wasn't a thing, the Drevlians didn't know that a third of their army was missing, dead in Olga's courtyard. New messengers were sent. Ah, uh, hey, did you hear from our other friends? I'm sure they just got lost. Anyway, our king really wants to marry you. She demurely said to the new guys, Hey, you know, y'all are dirty from the road and you must be tired. How about you just go to a sauna, clean up, and then I'll speak to you when you come out. They didn't come out. She boarded up the sauna and basically torched them alive. Patron saint. Olga then decides to mix things up a little bit. She goes this time to the Drevlian lands to pay homage to Igor's memory. Not. That's kind of what she said to their king. Y'all, they didn't have movies back then or troops. This is a trap. We know this is a trap. They did not know this was a trap. The Trevlians decided, hey, future queen is here. Let's relax with lots of mead, ale, bread, meat, etc. But mostly mead and ale. Olga has her ladies walk around and just keep refilling those goblets. Keep refilling those cups. Meanwhile, Olga and her servants were not drinking. This is kind of about the time where if they had read Song of Ice and Fire, somebody would have been playing the Reigns of Castamere. This is a little Red Wedding-y. Only in this case, they brought the Red Wedding to the Drevlians. Anyway, when they were all basically passed out, toasted, very, very, very drunk, Olga and her ladies-in-waiting walked around and, like any good party, started slitting all their throats. Y'all, patron saint, and she is not done donging yet. She has used fire, she has used water, and a whole lot of earth, and a side of mashed potatoes and some ale. We're gonna need a little wind. 
since the Drevlians are not taking the hint, Olga rolled her eyes, rolled up her sleeves, and decided she's just going to have to go to war. Get this over with. But remember, she is a lady. She can't just lead an army. She wears a bra and petticoats. There is no way this demure pussycat of a lady could lead men into battle, right? I mean, there are rules to massacres and obliterating your enemies. She's not just going to go rogue. So she collects all their neighbors' armies, gets her husband's old forces, her son, which some sources assume that he's three, some say he's ten, but they all say he was the male heir, and he had to lead the men into battle and cast the first attack on the Drevlians, which he did on his horse. I'm picturing a little kindergartner on a miniature pony named Butterscotch. Butterscotch the pony trots out, and her son heaves a spear to mark the beginning of battle. It's said that his spear barely cleared the head of his own horse. <laughs> After that first spear was tossed, the massacre began in full. The Drevlians got trapped in their own city, and they were under attack for quite some time. Some sources suggest over a year. Olga, at this point, seeing that they are hungry, have no resources left, proposes peace. And the Drevlians are like, uh, this is a trap, right? And Olga's like, nah, we have all your money. You don't have any fur. You don't have anything at all, honestly. So how about this? How about just give me a pigeon and a sparrow from every house in the city and we'll call it square. The city goes, uh, okay. Olga says, great. So they take the birds back to Olga City, where she gets a little help attaching some burning wood in some stories, and others say they attached a piece of cloth and a string laced in sulfur to the birds. But either way, where do pigeons and sparrows go when released? Home. The wood, or the sulfur and cloth, was lit on each bird, and each bird was released. As everyone provided birds, every single house in the Drevlian City burned at the same time time, making it both impossible to put out the fires and also made the people of the city run for their lives. As people left, it said that she instructed her army to just kill some of the civilians, give some as slaves to others, and left some alive to finally pay the tribute that they didn't pay earlier when they killed her husband. Patron Saint. So yes, she shows up in sources, but the main source, the primary chronicle, was written a thousand years after Olga's death. And at the time, it's important to recognize that things get a bit blown out of proportion and that these things may have happened to other countries, other tribes, other leaders, and maybe she had all of these cool things attributed to her, or maybe she did all these things. But either way, she absolutely lived. She absolutely existed. But this might be a bit of a real Olga versus the staged Olga. Either way, Olga has one final trick up her sleeve. It's really more of an epilogue, not really a cliffhanger. I think it's pretty clear why she's the patron saint of widows. Her husband died, and that's what started our whole story today. But why the saint of converts? So she travels to Constantinople. You know, Istanbul was once Constantinople or something. I don't know how the song goes. Go listen to the They Might Be Giants version. Anyway, she goes there to answer a marriage proposal from Constantine, which it turns out there were more than one Constantine. They are like the King Louis of France. There are just a lot. But this one was the seventh. Anyway, Constantine seven, apparently, according to the Chronicle, was super into tricky ladies. Well, actually, here's the quote. She was fair of countenance and wise as well. But we can all read between the lines, right? Constantine wanted Russia and Kiev. It didn't hurt that Olga was cunning and tricky and probably a certified hottie. But remember, the tricky bit. This is why he liked her. So Olga travels to be baptized in front of Constantine, which you can see him just jamming at the bit. Ooh, she's converting her religion for me. Russia is within my grasp. I'm digging all of this. But what do you think Olga just decided to do this without doing her homework first? Y'all, we've met her. So she asked him to do the baptism, which he eagerly obliges. And then after he baptizes her, he was like, so are we getting hitched or not, right? And she, I'm guessing with a twinkle in her eye, 
reminded him that because he baptized her, he was now her godfather. And as a result, she couldn't possibly marry her spiritual father. That would be a little incesty and not at all okay in the eyes of God. She said, thinking back to the burned alive soldiers, the burning soldiers, the slit-throated soldiers, the flaming bird soldiers. But marrying the guy who dunked you in water, that's the part she's saying isn't cool in the eyes of God? Well, it worked. Constantine apparently, according to the text, simply said, quote, Olga, you have outwitted me. Which in the sitcom of her life would just be an image of him saying, oh, Olga. And he would turn to the camera and just shrug. Some historians do dispute this whole story, saying that he already had an empress at the time. But we've all seen the meme. Why not both? It is the 900s after all. And according to the texts, he did give her a ton of gold, silver, silk vases, and then sent her on her way. Not really getting a wife, but gaining a daughter. Which, ew, weird. I was going to marry you, but I guess you'll just be my kid? I don't like it. Either way, Olga of Kiev is a patron saint of converts because she did attempt to convert what is now Russia, which was then pagan to Christianity. But she didn't quite nail the dismount on that effort. However, her grandson, Vladimir the Great, a much better name than some of the guys from last week's episode, was able to get people on board with Christianity. I'm unclear how Christian the methodology was, though, to convert these people, or if he used some of his, uh, Grammy's tricks to force the issue. I ran out of time to properly look into him. But 600 years after her death, she was named a saint. And the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Ruthenian Greek Catholic Church, and the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church all consider her equal to the apostles. That's a pretty big deal. Her life inspired both a ballet in 1981. This might actually just get me to like ballet. But also a band called Gorod, fronted by an art historian. Oh, this is not your average art historian music mashup. You might imagine a, well, maybe a ballet mashup, right? It's the exact opposite. Julian Dyer's band, a death metal screamer band inspired by the murderous women in Czech art. He ventured out of the Czech art section and stumbled into the Russian Isle at the library while doing his master's thesis on the same topic. This is how he came across Olga's story, and he used it to inspire a concept screamer album. Given that her path of destruction was pretty epic, he went on and immortalized her in music form? She also clearly inspired Cersei Lannister of A Song of Ice and Fire fame, minus the sibling affection. Now you get it, right? But also the USA military in World War II. In World War II, the US military, yep, the very same one that brought you LSD to mine murder goats, failed spy kitties, and more, decided to pull a page out of the patron saint's flighted warfare book which was really just one page and consisted completely of the birds who torched the town. A month after the attack on Pearl Harbor, a day that will live in infamy when Japan attacked U.S. soil, which was the final straw for the United States to get involved in World War II, an unassuming dentist in Pennsylvania, who happened to be friends with Eleanor Roosevelt, the president's wife, had an idea. I don't know how he got the idea. He was apparently inspired by bats he saw on a trip that roosted before dawn, and he knew that they could carry quite a bit of weight. But I suspect that there might have been more influences on his idea process. Podcasts weren't a thing yet, and neither were the Rejected Princesses books where I was first introduced to Olga. (laughs) I'm guessing laughing gas after hours? Anyway, his idea was to equip bats with timed incendiary devices— bombs attached to bats with little timers so when they went to roost in Tokyo's mostly wooden city because they didn't use concrete as a building material in those days the bats would roost the little bombs would go off simultaneously through the city torching it to the ground this idea was not laughed out of the oval office instead it was embraced by the president after a zoologist okayed it And it wasn't just any zoologist, but the zoologist who coined the term echolocation. You know the thing the bats do to see at night? 
But this zoologist also happened to argue that animals are conscious, just like humans. This is something that I have heard debated in very recent history at dog training conferences by other scientists. What is consciousness? Dogs are just programmed. Bull. Anyway, Mr. Animals have a consciousness, but sure, let's take bombs to them and send them into another country to burn down their capital city after a dentist had said this. And this is a quote. The bat was the lowest form of animal life. The reasons for its creation have remained unexplained. Bats were created by God to await this hour to play their part in the scheme of free human existence and to frustrate any attempt of those who dare to desecrate our way of life. To which the President of the United States said, quote, This man is not a nut. It sounds like a perfectly wild idea, but is worth looking into. No, sir. This man was a nut. And this was not an idea worth looking into. However, look into it they did, and this is what happens when you send the U.S. military to do an Olga's job. It's here that, remember, dentist assembled a team that consisted of a mammologist, Jack Von Bloker, his assistant, Jack Kofer, which I kept reading as Jack Bauer, a spaghetti Western actor named Tim Holt, a former gangster, and a former hotel manager. A scientist named Orzo Wiswell, who apparently loved bats, said the morality or the ecological consequences of sacrificing a few million bats didn't occur to them at all. Things are about to go very, very wrong for the U.S. military again. While the original plan was to arm the bats with white phosphorus, American chemist Louis Pfizer joined the team and white phosphorus was replaced with his invention napalm, which was ultimately just glued to the front of these bats. The container in which to place the bats, not the incendiary, but instead with napalm, humans are awful, was a five-foot sheet metal tube that could hold over a thousand bats. The boom sauce that was placed in a small cellulose container that the military called H2 containers. Funny enough, H2, hydrogen, that's another kind of bomb. The idea was to drop the giant tube filled with a thousand bats all armed after dark fell. The tube falling from the plane would have a parachute. The sides of the tube would just gracefully fall away. The bats would scatter to the winds and voila! Here's where you don't mess with Olga perfection. 1. The bats were accidentally released in a testing site in Carlsbad, New Mexico. They roosted under a fuel tank and promptly exploded. Whoopsie. 2. The project was canceled after the military realized the bats wouldn't be ready-ready until 1945. By then, in a year, the military was all in on another project, the atomic bomb. Besides, 3. The project was already running over $2 million. Sure, that can get you a cute 100-square-foot leaking basement apartment in a city. But in today's money, that's over $19.3 million today. I mean, much of that, I'm sure, was cleaning up Carlsbad, New Mexico from napalm and an explosion. And not to be outdone, the British got into this too. Either they played the weirdest game of telephone ever, and when the U.S. said bat bomb, the Brits went rat bomb? Got it. Or if they came up with this all on their own, but the British decided to arm rats with explosives too, deploy them near German trains and German boiler rooms. The British called this Olga-inspired animal incendiary a win, not because the rats detonated, they didn't. The first and only shipment of rocketing rodents was sniffed out by the Germans. So how is this a great success? Well, the Germans evidently spent a ton of time and manpower and money looking for more shipments of rats with boom sauce that they ended up calling this a win for the Brits. And we did still ultimately end World War II with the dropping of two atomic bombs. But let's look back at Olga. Who run the world? Girls. So the next time someone says, act like a lady, 
just know that you have options. I have been wanting to do this story forever, and I'm so glad we saved it for number 50. The intersection of animals at humanity, right? This was pretty grim for our animal friends, but hopefully we learn maybe not to use animals in warfare, and that really humans can be pretty terrible. So this week, try to go out and be kind to someone. Show people that not every human is awful. Maybe pay for a coffee for the person behind you in line, or buy the janitorial staff at your kid's school a box of donuts and to-go coffee. Tip a waitress 100%. Call someone you haven't talked to in a while. Read books to the animals at your animal shelter. Or you can do something like my kiddo did this week. Write a letter to someone who isn't expecting it and just send it to them by mail, listing out all the things that make that person a really cool, nice person. Thanks, kiddo. And thank you for joining me today on Bewilder Beasts. If you want more historical animals, animals in science, silly animals in the news, all of it, check out the Patreon, patreon.com slash bewilderbeastpod. Bonus episodes for everyone start at a dollar a month and extra goodies for those who support at a higher level. If there are topics that you'd be interested in hearing about on the podcast, which some of you are doing, and it's so good, I cannot wait to get to those topics. If you know of any historical animals who changed the world, animals who help humans, or animals who showed humans what hubris is, send them in to bewilderbeastpod at gmail.com. Tweet at bewilderpod, bewilderbeastpod on Facebook, and bewilderbeast on Instagram. I'm Melissa McHugh McGrath with Mud Stuff Media. Now go get curious. I got today's information from a lot of places. <laughs> Theatlantic.com, military.wikia.org on the Bat Bomb. Medium.com on the history of the Bat Bomb, Wikipedia.org, My God Thank You on the Bat Bomb, Olga of Kiev, and also on Donald Griffin, the zoologist. HoustonCultureMap.com, remember Moxie Labouche from the top? Your brain on facts that I recommended? Check out episode 163, Project Pigeon and Acoustic Kitty, where I got info from today's Bat Bombs. Rejected Princesses. This is one of my favorite books. It's Tales of History's Boldest Heroines, Hellions, and Heretics by Jason Parath. Search in your pod player of choice and listen to any of his interviews. His research in the depiction of Olga of Kiev has stuck with me for years. So when I was thinking of a number 50, this absolutely inspired today's entire episode. Britannica.com on St. Olga. The podcast Endless Thread. Stop everything after you finish listening to this and then go listen. My God, it's so good. Also, the Today in History blog and the show Fierce Females, Olga of Kiev, Sweet Revenge. Sweet, sweet revenge indeed. And you get to hear some of that death metal. So links as always in the description of today's episode. Intro music is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Leibowitz. Interstitial music is by MK2. Additional music provided by Pixabay and freesound.org. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, review, and the very best thing you can do is share this with your friends. Thank you so much for listening, and I can't wait to start the next 50. I'll see you guys next week. Bye-bye.